Thank you for turning to page 121. I have been playing advanced Dungeons and Dragons for over 40 years, and have been a dungeon master for just as long. Since 1982, my primary campaign has been set in the world of Greyhawk, as this is by far my favorite world in which to DM. I've DM'd about 90% of the games for our group over the years. In fact, my whole family are regular members of our gaming group. My wife has played since we started dating in 1981, and both my adult sons have played since they were little kids. But that's enough about me for right now. Let's get to the reason you turn to page 121. Let's go on to our main topic of the night. Valpurgis, a night of terror in AD&D. In the early 1980s, I belonged to a D&D club, which, luckily for me, was held within walking distance of my house. I was one of their regular DMs and was known for crafting well-rounded games and encouraging the players to have fun. One October, in a special holiday event, I decided I wanted to run a Halloween-themed game, but I wasn't sure how to go about doing this. I had many players in my games at the club who liked to boast their characters were just about unkillable. I wanted to show them as DM, nothing is unkillable. The problem was, I didn't want to anger my players, and I still wanted to maintain the fun atmosphere I'd been working hard to build up at the club. What to do? Then it hit me. Just combine the two ideas into a Halloween-themed game where I would actually kill the unkillable characters. I called it Valpurgis. The real Valpurgis night is a holiday celebrated in parts of Europe on the night of April 30th to May 1st. Similar to Halloween, Valpurgis night is a night where evil rises and good people tremble. The ideal Valpurgis game is run for characters preferably 8th to 12th level. While I have in the past run both lower and higher groups, 8 to 12 is by far my favorite to DM. At these levels, the characters have enough durability to be a bit of a challenge, but are not so tough as to be unkillable in the time I had allotted. Each game of Valpurgis starts with a time limit. At the club, we played from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., with the first half hour dedicated to allowing everyone to get settled. Then for the next three and a half hours, it was up to me to kill all the characters in play. My current group starts at 7 and goes until 10, or until every character is dead, whichever comes first. The point of Valpurgis is for everyone at the table to have fun. I always explain to my players the game does not count for anything in my campaign. A player can use potions, expend charges from wands, whatever they want. They simply track everything on a separate sheet of paper, and at the end of the night, the character goes on to the next game unblemished. Any of the encounters I use in Valpurgis games actually come from ideas I have while working up a regular D&D game. Sometimes I decide the encounters are just too powerful for my regular game. I jot the ideas down, and I use them in that year's Valpurgis game. An important aspect of Valpurgis is for the DM to limit the player's mobility. The easiest way to do this is to start the adventure in a dungeon and explain to everyone that the party is sealed in until dawn when the evil power of Valpurgis wanes. I also stress that teleports are line of sight only and any form of extra dimensional travel simply doesn't work. I also don't allow portable holes, bags of holdings, rope tricks, and things like that to work either. However, I typically don't share that fact with players beforehand, which can lead to some pretty hilarious, if somewhat unfortunate, situations for the characters. I have run a few Valpurgis games outdoors, specifically where the players were cordoned off in one section of the woods, but it's tough to pin down the players in this type of environment. Typically, by 8th to 12th level, player characters have access to fly and levitate, among other things, that make them really hard to pin down in an outdoor environment. I even had one player who tried to ride the event out by hiding in a tree. By now I bet you're wondering about one of the key aspects of D&D game survival, healing. Well, in Valpurgis, healing is handled quite a bit differently. In fact, each form of healing only does the bare minimum. For example, a Cure Light Wounds was normally worth 1 die 8 in an ordinary AD&D game. In Valpurgis, it's only worth one point. A Cure Serious Wounds in AD&D is worth two die eight plus one healing. But in Valpurgis, it's only worth three points. One for each die, plus the plus one. A heal spell will bring a character to 50% of his total hit points. For example, a character with 80 hit points would heal to 40 hit points through the use of a heal spell in Valpurgis. Interestingly, I had a nervous player years ago whose character was down about 20% of his hit points. He panicked and cast a heal spell, which actually reduced his hit points from down a mere 20% to down to 50%. As for raise dead or resurrection, the affected person does come back, 
but they come back as a zombie-like monster of full hit dice and hit points under the DM's control. Usually I have them immediately attack the party. As you can see, I mess with some of the basic elements and rules in AD&D for a Valpurgis game. However, I feel this is some of the challenge and part of the fun for my players to try to overcome. Now how about some examples of encounters I've created over the years? Let's start with the Blood Cloud. A Blood Cloud is a swarm of Sturges so thick they just swarm around a player and automatically take 4 die 8 hit points of damage per round. I thought the Cloud would do about 40 points off someone as I was only going to let the Cloud remain for 2 rounds. But, as is often the case, it didn't work out that way. After the first round, several of the characters ran off, leaving my victim to his fate. Unfortunately for this player, one of the other party members decided to try to help him out by throwing a fireball into the Cloud of Sturges. Apparently this player forgot about the character trapped inside the Blood Cloud, who promptly failed his saving throw, and that was that. This is an example of what I call a soft encounter. A soft encounter is when I expect to take some hit points off a few characters to soften them up and maybe make them use some limited resources. The next one is one of my favorites and is, coincidentally, also one of the most lethal. It started off easily enough when a group of monks appeared before the party. It was only after the first strike that the party noticed the monks had bare hands and feet. That's when they realized these monks were actually vampires trained in the martial arts. As any experienced AD&D player will know, the touch of a vampire drains two energy levels. These monks got three attacks per round, so they had a possibility to drain a maximum of six levels per monk, or 18 levels per round. In addition, each monk also got its regular damage from the successful attack. This encounter was a lot of fun, and by the time it was over, I had dropped four characters. This is also one of the encounters that is still regularly talked about at our gaming table to this day. Now I'll give an example of a specially designed character kill. This particular example was designed for one of my regular players, who still games with me to this day. He also seems to have the misfortune of being on the receiving end of my first 20 of the night almost every game, but he's always a good sport about it and takes pride in it. In this encounter, I had him facing off against a Lich Cleric. Unfortunately for the player, the Lich didn't just use its usual chill touch, but also a harm spell, which is, for anyone who doesn't know, the opposite of a heal spell. When the Lich touched the character, the character lost all but one die four hit points. Then I hit him with the damage of the Chill Touch. The Harm Spell had dropped him to two hit points, and the Chill Touch maxed out for an additional 12 points of damage. A fine one and done. The important thing to remember when running your own Valberg's Kill Fest is to have fun. I've run literally dozens of players in this annual game over the last 38 years, and every one of them really seemed to enjoy it. Keeping the tradition alive, I ran my annual Valberg's game earlier this week. We started at 7 with five player characters ranging from 14th to 21st level, some of them very powerful. We were done at 9.05 and sat around talking about sports and current events until the end of our gaming session. Well, that closes the book on this episode of page 121. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for watching.